so much for um, for agreeing to come on because I know that you're extremely busy at the moment and you said to me that you were getting a lot of interview requests and I know that you're working on various <coughs> projects at the moment and we can get to mm. that a little bit later on. But the sure. reason that I, um, well, first of all, before I go on to the reason that I contacted you, you're in Amsterdam at the moment. So we're, I'm recording this in the evening. It's in the morning for you. Yeah. What's What's going on in Europe? What's it feel like in Europe? Obviously, you're a lot closer to what's happening in um, Ukraine and Russia, and, mm. and you've had impacts on uh, price wave impacts on, on what's going on in Amsterdam. I think food price of food also has been um, problematic there. Is that is that right? This is one of the one of the reasons I'm in Amsterdam. And my wife, uh, I met my wife here about seven eight years ago, and she had lived here for twenty five years. She's Thai by nationality, but lived in Holland ever since she came over here with her second husband, um, and um, and. It, and so I chose Amsterdam because of her, but also I did my research on, you know, where could I live in the Europe? And of course, English speaking, I'm monolingual, so it had to be somewhere to Amsterdam or, or Portugal were the two. Uh, and then uh, guess what the world, guess guess where Amst where Holland sits in the, in the table of world exports by, 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 by value of food? Oh, well, now you've put me on the spot. I don't know. I know. Tell me. <laughs> number, num I don't look. No, number two behind America. Yeah, yeah wow. Yeah. Okay, so that this this is the world's most productive food region, and that's been reflected in the impact on food. So food prices have barely moved here. However, in the UK, where I also spent a substantial amount of time, it's some basic food prices have doubled. And one of my friends made a great uh, song and dance about how it now costs more to buy rhubarb than it does to produce locally than it costs to buy a watermelon imported from somewhere in in, uh, in South of South America or or Africa. Um, mm -hmm. So food prices have risen quite dramatically. But the main difference here is energy prices. And I just got my most recent energy bill, and it has gone down. Right. Okay. Now that again, that again reflects domestic policy. So the uh, the Dutch government has done the social democratic thing of saying we can't afford to have these prices pushing people into poverty. So we're going to cap the prices. And in fact, the cap plus the subsidies have mean prices have fallen for people in Holland. On the other hand, in England, they're going the neoliberal route. And I have uh, seen people who are saying they're, they're uh, oil, their their uh, gas bills. I presume this is for a quarter. Have risen from 150 pounds. To 850 pounds. Mm. It may have been for a month. Mm. So there was a price applied, but the, the British limited the limited the the, the, the cap uh, mm. rather than the rise. So people are facing an enormous increase in both food costs and energy costs in the UK, and that is starting to cause quite a bit of protest. So the UK is still following, even though the UK didn't join the euro, which I think was a, you know the one decent decision it ever made. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the euro countries did which is a terrible decision but nonetheless they've got a social democratic tradition and the uk hasn't and we're seeing the difference here in the impact on poor people and I, by poor i mean anybody who's in the bottom 60 percent of the population mm. uh, so europe is doing better on that front except where that hasn't happened in italy i think it's the one case where they've let energy prices rise and there have been riots so mm. uh yeah it, it is uh ha having quite a bit of impact the, the one thing which saved us actually was global warming because this is the this is the it's warmest not, winter yeah yeah in pretty, pretty much in well you recorded history mm. um and the result was people the the, the drastic building up of, of of natural gas stocks by buying um you know buying from america um and and getting as much as they can the third party routes which they start in russia but they go through another country and gets relabeled mm. um that that meant the stocks have not been exhausted so you haven't had a price spike uh, or a shortage. So it's lucky time, but hey, it's, summer's coming and let's see what happens during summer. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got family in the UK, obviously, and and um, my mother's in the UK and she's said to me a few yeah. times, she's had the uh, warnings that she's had from the gas companies about how much the bills are going to go up. Really worrying, yeah. uh, really kind of frightening. Hey, factor, of, factor, of, factor of eight or 10, that yeah. type of increase. And, and and that I mean, in some ways, it reflects the the rising cost of energy, which is going to be something we're all going to have to deal with uh, mm. as 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 we go forward. Um, but really it is really. also just policy, a policy decision yeah. to let the price system yeah. do it. And the, the, the UK is one of the most unequal societies on the planet. So the top echelon, the the finance sector, the salaries there are just unbelievable. And unfortunately, so are the ones at the other end, but in the opposite direction. Mm. So, so quite a few people are surviving on, you know, in, incomes of 20,000 pounds or less 
And when you start, I think you know, gas bills hitting about a thousand pounds a month. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, it, it's criminal, really, because it doesn't have to be it a is. situation like that. And of course, the, the and and I think also there's a there's just a, a economic ignorance within parliamentarians where they don't understand really how the economy works. They don't understand the policies to put in place, or they're they're held to ram, ransom by the monopolists that are around them. You know, they get yeah. to to. It, it's, it's, Sort of. It's also following economic policy, economic theory, because economic theory says um, that marginal cost rises and that the most efficient price is where the, the price the price is set by marginal cost. So that's been actually built into the regulations in the UK. It's also something in Australia, but only in the wholesale market. Here it hits the retail market as well. So the most expensive producer gets to set the price for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you look at the real world situation, um, how is slightly different. There are elements where the, the marginal cost can rise, but normally if the fixed costs are far greater, the marginal costs are relatively constant. Uh, mm -hmm. If everybody priced at the real marginal cost, they can have a collapse. Instead, the spikes come through. That's so mm -hmm. what the Australian system does is cut off the spikes. They don't hit the retail level. Uh, but the, the British one lets the spikes pass through and then you get these outrageous prices. And in fact, in Australia's case, that's the reason Australia didn't introduce um, market pricing for retail. Because mm. when they looked at the wholesale pattern, uh, the wholesale pattern was so vi violent and such incredible prices we charged at times where there were squeezes um, mm. that they decided they you know, imagine if you went to went to bed with the air conditioner and woke up owing the country, owing the power company a thousand dollars. Crazy, crazy, yeah, yeah crazy mm. situation. I mean, Amsterdam is such a beautiful place, really, isn't it? I mean, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. But one, I know a little bit about it. I've done some some study in Amsterdam. I've some friends that live over there, and um, uh, one of the things about Amsterdam, though, is that the cost of housing is incredibly high. Are you in in Amsterdam, or are you in are you yeah. one of the outer suburbs, or where? No, where? I'm, I'm five. I'm five hundred meters from Central Station. Right. right. Uh, that's why. That's why I am here. I bought a place which uh, was just a remarkable property the, the dutch don't want to buy in this particular building because it's right at, if you know the main shopping drag i'm sure you've been along the main shopping drag there called new uh called uh new wendick hmm. okay well that's we're on the corner of new wendick and new and new new street so we're in new 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 wendick street yeah wow. uh which is pretty pretty crazy uh but that's but that's uh the dutch don't buy because they've got too many tourists and it's too noisy this particular building happens to have solid industrial concrete um, and totally unlike all the other buildings in the area and completely quiet. And uh, yeah, so they, 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 you don't face competition from the Dutch to buy here. So we bought it a couple of hundred thousand euro cheaper, I think, than you'd pay in the same region. But the prices are it, it's sort of comparable to Sydney prices in that sense, you know, ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, the rents would be going up there as they are everywhere. Have they got an Airbnb problem there? Have they done anything? Are the short term lets playing into that? Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Amsterdam actually bans, uh, is quite happy to use bans on things like Airbnb. So it does exist in parts of the city, but they ban it in others and they regulate how many months you can do it in other parts. So I believe in my building, we're only allowed three months of the year or two months of the year for Airbnb. Um, mm -hmm. So that means you don't get the incredible pressure on, on rental availability that applies in many other cities. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't follow rental prices. Uh, I did follow uh, house prices, of course, but not rental prices. But they, I, I don't hear many complaints about it, put it that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, you'd hear a lot of complaints about it over here in Australia. Because yeah, I've seen. Record low vacancy rates. Um, and then, of course, they've opened the doors for immigration and the immigration policy. Again. Pushing it back mm. up to record levels, you know. So mm. the, we need more people coming in the country. And that's uh, that's at least the spruik that's given. And... Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, the the horror stories, of course, have hit the press. And it's not new in Australia. I mean, we had horror stories around 2015, 2016 of uh, crowded houses in Sydney and, um, you know, uh, landlords that were renting out to students and getting a very high yield. But they were renting out, you know, they were creating rooms out of rooms and putting sheets to separate, you know, beds. And I've seen, I've, I've, I've been inside a few of those houses with student friends. And yeah, I just thinking, holy shit, uh, you know, you, you literally, uh, in, in some cases, this thing a place in Surrey Hills, I saw, um, you you had a five, uh, less than two metres width, if mm. you were lucky, one and a half metres more likely, and that's where you'd stayed. And there'd be, you know, be a terrace house, which would have contained a, a wife and you know, family, a family and two kids, mm. contained 16 students. 
Mm. And and at the time, I mean, that it was in the press at the time there about, you know, the what, what are we going to do about, it's just like it's in the press every day, isn't it? what are we going to do about housing affordability? What are we going to do about the rental crisis? And then here we've got to uh, 2023, beginning of 2023. I almost got the year wrong there. That's how quickly things <laughs> Uh, we get to the get to 2023 and the situation is worse than it has ever been because the vacancy yeah. rates at record lows and on top of that you've got an airbnb problem you know we went through the pandemic where you know sh- all the short term lets were being pushed onto the long term market because yeah. they have anybody going in them and now of course it's gone it's spun the other way you know you, mm, you can actually mm. get a lot more money um it, renting something out an airbnb so the the crisis we're, we're, we're going to have a lot more of the overcrowding that's going to um occur in the cities particularly because of immigration uh, mainly coming mm. in the, um and melbourne so yeah i mean it, it's and of course um rents uh uh make up part of the cpi so you've got and therefore they turn up as part of the inflation rate. So you've got to then stamp on it by putting up the interest rate, which of course is going to reduce the level of construction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah. But it, it my my mark houses on the market as house prices crash and people find they can't afford them, and then but then they end up in the rental market. So you know you've got one of these you know catch twenty two situations that, that the uh, Australian government in particular has pushed itself into. But it's got plenty of company from the countries around the world treating yeah. a house or housing as an investment rather than a consumption item. That's right. And and in my job and in my line of work, when people come to me to buy property of their home buyers, I say to them, you've got to think about it like an investment because that's how policy treats it, treats it like an investment, mm. treat it like a home. So we need to make a financial decision about this. Um, mm. But the the uh, of course, you've just touched on you've actually encapsulated something really interesting there because you've you've really <laughs> in one sentence, given the ridiculousness of the situation that we are in and this situation. Mm completely ridiculous because there is one tool to control inflation that the RBA have. No one else is doing anything to control it. House prices aren't included in CPI. So that's been, that was ignored <laughs> anyway. You know, the fact that we mm. had a huge, humongous um, housing boom that that ran to the sort of latter part of 2022. Um, well, sorry, <clears throat> beginning of 2022. And, <clears throat> and, you know, so now interest rates are going up, but they're not actually doing anything to control inflation. People think that it will control inflation. But of course, it, it's not controlling inflation. If anything, it's making it worse because it's putting pressure on businesses to obviously um, wait to keep mm. wages, to keep price, play, pace with inflation, commodity prices. Mm. Going up. Um, inflation wasn't it, it wasn't a demand inflation thing anyway. It was to do with the supply yeah. chain. Um, and then you get the uh, governor of the RBA pulled up in front of Senate to explain himself. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it couldn't be more ridiculous. It's just such a, it's like a clown show, you know. Well, you know, you, you, you've got inflation. He's got one tool to control it. So we'll pull him up in front of Senate. And then the senators all vary these serious questions. Well, why are you pushing Australia into recession? Isn't there something else you can do? And and of course, the main focus was on mortgage holders, you know, because yeah. that's who it's hitting. It's not hitting. It. If you haven't got a mortgage, you you know, obviously you have to shop around a little bit because the prices are going up. But it's it's yeah. they're the demographic. I mean, your take on on the craziness of this from from where you sit would be very interesting. Well, I actually give people a bit of advice uh, about researching it. I don't, mainstream economics uh, has got a bunch of simplistic models that imply that there's a, a negative relationship between interest rates and the price level. And uh, I have a, a great colleague who's a non-orthodox economist called Blair Fix. Uh, B-L-A-R-R, first name, F-I-X, the second. He runs a blog called Economics from the Top Down, and he's a top-class statistician. And he's been through the statistics and said that empirically, uh, it's basically interest rates are driven by inflation, not the other way around. So you, they're not a control mechanism. Mm-hmm. And uh, I haven't re- read the full of his full of his posts as it happens, but that's, that's the, the basic thrust. Empirically, he finds that uh, inflation drives up interest rates. Interest rates don't drive down inflation. So you've got empirically it doesn't work. And then you look at the theory and the theory that the economists are using presumes that when you go shopping, you consider the long run interest rates uh, in your shopping decisions. So if they put up the interest rate, you make a rational decision to buy less less aubergines 
Hmm. And they call, I think they call that the Euler equation. And it, 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 they even admit themselves empirically it's been falsified. But that's what their model tells them. So the model says if you put up the interest rate, you'll bring the inflation rate down. That's what they're doing. It isn't working, but it's it's like you're wearing a, you know, you're wearing a bit of those, you know, what do they call it, the Gelstalt glasses that turn everything upside down. And mm-hmm. you think, therefore, to walk down the street, you've got to stand on your head. <laughs> um, so that 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 is the uh, the nature of the, the problem, that they simply have a model which all, all mainstream economists use, a type of class of model, and that tells them that this will work. And what actually happens is they think it's, they talk about inflationary expectations. Mm. And so they think that's what actually determines your decision to shop now. So, and they also think because interest rates will reduce inflationary expectations. So if you put up the interest rate, you reduce inflationary expectation and hey, presto, inflation will fall. That's mm. that's the logic they've got caught up in. Now, empirically, it's tested. You look at the logic of the model, it's nonsense, but that's what they're wearing and they're in charge. Mm. The, the they're in charge, is, of course, is the is the statement because it becomes incredibly frustrating watching this in an environment yeah. that's, that's affecting businesses and affecting people, you know, mm. particularly if they've got mortgages. And also that they yeah. were told by the governor that interest rates wouldn't go up until uh, 2024, that they would stay in the <laughs> I mean, it, it's so that it's it is a ridiculous situation, but the the focus is almost like people cannot see, like you said, you know, they got they kind of got these binoculars on, but they cannot see outside to really understand how to control inflation. If, if someone was to say to you, like, if you were to, to come in and, they, and the government can do well, how do we control the inflation that's happening at the moment in the economy? What would you, where would you start with that? What would you say? Because we, we're going to have people that are listening to this now that are yeah. not going to understand it. And, and I feel that we need to, people need to understand this because if we're ever going to get a change in government, and you know all about this because last time I interviewed mm. you was just, Actually, it was days after the election, it, but you were running for um, oh, yeah. the party you were running for now. Or was <laughs> uh, they, they made a silly decision to use their initials. It used to be the new Liberals. The yes. ban was banned by Labour and Liberal getting together saying you can't use the. So they became TNL, which only meant something to people who knew who the party was. So, yes. I mean, I think I think the leaders of the party now admit they made a very bad tactical decision there. Uh, so TNL just uh, ran and came last everywhere, including in North Sydney, where the leader, the leader mm-hmm. ran. Uh, very good candidate, but he realised that people would say, yes, I'm going to vote for you. And then despite preferential voting, they voted for the uh, the, the teal candidate ahead of him. And then that meant, of course, he got you know, expected 10%, he got half a percent. Uh, so a very ineffective electoral campaign. And that's my first and last tilt for politics. Right. OK. So you're not going, but you, you put a fair bit of work into that because you wrote a paper for that as to how we're going to, well, mm-hmm. it, it focused obviously on debt jubilees, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And really, really fundamentally changing how the economy works, and that's what's got to be what we see now has to be dismantled, and it has to be re envisioned and put back together. And, and how do we start to do that? Because unless people understand it, unless they understand what you're saying to them and how you're mm. explaining it, we're never going to see a change. We're always going to be in this situation where we have this crazy show of asking the RBA governor one one of the the politicians asked him they said what other tools do you have and he said i only have one tool <laughs> it's like, and there's only one thing i can do so i mean it's just See, crazy. It, yeah. it is crazy but econom- economists are responsible for that because um i mean partly politicians are very happy to hand over control of the interest rate lever to a government because when we, back the, this has always been believed that interest rates control inflation okay it's not just the recent strand of economics this goes back quite a long way Non-mainstream people have been much more critical, but the mainstream has always thought you control inflation with interest rates, or you control economic activity using interest rates. Um, so when, but, but of course, what it meant was they were telling politicians when the politicians set the rate. We're going back before Paul Keating here. Uh, you've, you've got to put the rate up. Well, you know, a politician saying I'm going to put the rate up thinks I'm going to lose some votes. So they were very happy when the economist said, it better be handed over to the experts. So let's make the RBA independent and give it monetary policy. And politicians go, you, I don't have that responsibility anymore. Sure, you have it. But then economic theory, this states from about the, the late 1970s forward, started to develop uh, the, the, the new versions of models they use, which a Nobel Prize winner for economics is called nonsense. This is Paul Romer. Uh, described them as being post-real economics, but they built the interest rate in and they made that the, the key component and they convinced themselves that it was working up to up to the financial crisis. 
uh, because they took the credit for falling inflation, uh, falling peaks of unemployment, and they said it was all their work and what they call the great moderation. Then the financial crisis hit. Uh, well, you know, in any rational um, uh, endeavor, you would then say, well, there's something wrong with our model. But no, they've doubled down on the model. The model still says interest rates control everything. So in that sense, they're responsible for it. And the only really way to change it is to change economics. And, you know, you're talking to brick walls when it comes to trying to tell economists their models are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, where where do we start with that? I mean, it's funny you say it's the great, moder the great moderation changed into the, the Great Recession pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I, I think that the, you know, the, the one thing that I kind of see with the um, inflationary argument is that we're really ignoring where inflation really occurs, which is in the land market, because it's the land market and land prices going up, which obviously impact the economy because we need land yeah. for everything. <clears throat> eat from it so we sustain our entire existence from it and so when you put when land prices rise obviously that's putting you know businesses are having to pay more rents you know higher rents higher mm -hmm. cost of property which means there's a, a depressed effect on wages they have less money therefore to pay for wages or to put into productive um, research and development for their industries and so it, you know the ignoring that in the inflationary argument you know and having this basket obviously we have rents in it and we have housing costs but it doesn't include land i mean how, how do you kind of see that you know it's almost like you're blindfolded isn't it about what's really going on in the economy because you're not you're not seeing the role that land plays in the economy yeah i mean economists uh, completely exclude land and energy from their models so they have uh, models where production is generated using what they call technology which they simply have a single letter for. They don't explain where technology comes from. Times labor, times capital. There's no input from land. There's no input from energy. So I've done the work to show uh, you have to include energy as an input to labor and capital to explain how anything gets produced. Which is land. The basic logic is in a sense yeah. because that yeah. energy yeah. Logic is being derived from the natural elements. Yeah. We 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 land land is is a shorthand for the natural environment. Mm. And the natural environment in that sense includes the sun because without the sun, you know, we'd have land here, but it'd be frozen. Uh, so, so the, the the whole thing is is, the, is an ad natural non non human created environment in which we live, and that does not play a role in the economic theory of production. Now, I think you can see straight away, holy shit, they're in trouble in terms of understanding the real world. So you have a, a you have a model which excludes the natural environment, telling you how much you produce, ignoring the costs that come from the natural environment, ignoring the resources that are needed from the natural environment. So when things are stable in some sort of sense, you can make the model fit the data. But when things become volatile for whatever reason, bang, the, the, the data goes one way and the model goes the other. But all, they, all they're actually, are going to use it because they don't include health, land prices in the CPI. If they're looking at the CPI and unemployment, they're not even in, in, in an in a, in a analytic sense, they're not seeing the numbers you're worrying about. Mm. And there are no that they're here in the background. People are chatting, what about land prices? But that's not in the model, not what they're looking at. So they can't even see the phenomenon when it's actually happening around them. Mm. And they also, I'll just finish on this. They also have models that argue that there's no link between land prices and economic activity. Mm. Mm. The other thing, of course, that they miss, which you have spoken about for years, is credit. And yeah. how <clears throat> system impacts the economy and the role of private debt in the economy now you know i think people have become more aware of this really since 2008 mm. because it was sort of following that and all the questions as to well why did we have a recession well let's go back a little bit further from that because you mm. you you got a lot of flack in australia around that time because you were saying it's like i've got inter international prize at the same time as getting flack in australia which shows you what's going on in it's, australia well, it, it's it's uh we're very isolated in australia i mean i understand yeah. that sort of being being you know from england and and traveling you come to australia is very isolated mm. and it's mm. a in in of itself and you you got a lot of flack at that time and as you said at the same at the same time you get a lot of international recognition you were hailed as a king in one area and and then a fool in the other um because mm. you know it was around that time that you said okay we're, we're heading for a financial crisis here you said it in i think what around 2005 um starting two like, like very almost, almost the beginning of 2006 so december 2005 i started warning of a global yeah. financial crisis. Most focused on Australia, because that's why I, I happen to live there. 
And I was trying to change policy in my hometown, fundamentally. But yeah, it was a global phenomenon. And I saw the data turning up in both Australian and American data, which is all I had access to at the time. And on that front, the Australian data was more extreme, it was more likely Australia was going to have a debt crisis than America. And, and then what what actually happened? I could I could I could go on for quite a while here, so you better shut me up when necessary. Well, I was going to say, I, I mean, I think it's a really fascinating story because you were really hailed a fool at that time because you said, "Look, house prices are going to go." You weren't yeah. correct because the I mean, two thousand and six. Obviously, now look, this is this is being recorded for the Land Cycle Investor publication, yeah. which is all about the eighteen year land cycle, which has a fair bit of mm. history find it and you know I, I think it's worth I think it's important for economists to understand that we do have a land cycle and to research the mechanisms behind as to why we have that cycle why do we have a boom and bust cycle in land now, well, see, this 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 is what <laughs> yes this this is what I was working on so that my basic logic I, because I'm a non-orthodox economist uh, I happen to shrek on the work of Irving Fisher and Hyman Minsky and their work made eminent sense to me and included private debt. So I included private debt in my model of what's called Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And I built that model back in 1992. It's a mathematical model, a uh, very simple mathematical model involving the wa wages as a share of GDP, the employment rate and the debt rate, private debt ratio. And that generated, the model generated a great moderation followed by, strictly speaking, diminishing of economic velocity followed by rising with a rising level of private debt. So that was what lay behind my claim that there's going to be a financial crisis, because when I looked at the ratio of private debt to GDP, it had been rising exponentially in Australia since the early 60s, an exponential in America since the 1940s, but at a slower rate. And I said that can't continue. When, that, when, that, when the ratio turns down, it means credit will go negative. And rather than credit adding to demand, and thereby, well, that's an economic heresy, according to economists, credit has no role in aggregate demand. But I said well, it has a role in aggregate demand. When it goes negative, it'll cause demand to go from very high to very low. We'll have a financial crisis. And uh, the, do you, should I discuss a little cameo? Because the, well, my, the claim where I got yes. most seen that was when I was interviewed by Kerry O'Brien on the 730 report. That's mm -hmm. where the comment about the 40% price fall came from. And I, I, Kerry accepted my analysis beforehand. And then the next day, he interviewed Kevin Rudd. <laughs> and he just he gave Kevin Rudd the, the heebie jeebies over my analysis. It was quite quite an aggressive interview, and then a week later, Rudd announced the the uh, the first home buyers grant. When well, they doubled and trebled the grant going to first home buyers, and Victoria added their own on top of that. So, if you're buying a new house on the outskirts of Melbourne, you could get thirty four thousand dollars from the government to buy that house. Yeah. Well, wow, that caused the house price. I wonder why that caused the house price bubble to restart. So, what happened when you look at the data is credit in Australia never turned negative. It went from about 20% of GDP to 2%, and then it turned around and went back up again. Mm. So my causal mechanism was correct because in America, it went from 15% to minus five, and they had a downturn. We went from 20% to two and then started rising again. Mm. So in a sense, I'm a bit like the guy sitting next to a, a, a teenage driver in a car saying, you're coming to this roundabout too fast, slow down. And then he does slow down and gets to the roundabout. All the other teenagers crash, and the driver looks at me and says, what are you talking about? That was safe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I can furnish that a little bit because in 2008, I mean, obviously, you know, people were looking for a technical recession. We didn't have a technical recession, but I worked in the housing market in 2008, was yeah. working as, as I do now. And it was a very bad time in 2008. Yeah. I worked for a buyer advocacy company. We lost all our buyers very quickly. So we were going obviously yeah. great into 2007. And then I was working for the, the, the guy I was working for was an excellent buyer advocate. Um, and he said to, it was the last rate rise. Remember, the interest rates were, were ramping up during that period as well, obviously, because the focus mm -hmm. was house prices going up at that time, <laughs> whatever else they were looking at. But uh, he said to me, I think when the last interest rate rise went up, he said, look, I, I, we were at an auction. And uh, people, he, and we hadn't seen a passing for like the whole year. And he said yeah. to me, "Just get prepared, Catherine. I think that I think the property is going to pass in. I think that last interest rate would be would have done it." And and he was absolutely right. And then we had a passing negotiation after that, mm -hmm. and the housing market went extremely quickly. And I guess what I want to herald you for, and and kind of wipe the slate, was that you called it absolutely accurately. I mean, if you're calling it in 2006, 2006 was the peak of the land yeah. bubble in the US. We, you were only twelve months out from really the peak of the of the land market in Australia, um, 
And I remember, of course, I remember Kevin Rudd. I mean, he did a he did a few other things. He also made it um, easy for temporary residents to purchase property yeah. at the time. Um, so there was a lot of demand that was going in. Well, the governments here are very good at tinkering around at property prices, you know, uh, uh, inflating them. I remember the the grants that were around at that time. Yeah, and, the, the, people, and this is this is all ignored. It. That's why I, I, I'm very careful as some of the officers bet these days. Because what happens is what happens to the bet takes over what's your argument, what's your analysis. So I had a, a, a conventional economist challenge me over climate change, and uh, you know, say I think this is a bet, and I gave him. I said, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you a bet if you give me an answer to this question. And the answer he gave was just dismissive shit. And I said, right, no bet. And he was horrified. This is the this is the cousin, the nephew of uh, of, of Bill no William Nordhaus, the guy who got the Nobel Prize for climate change work in 2018. So I've learned my lesson. You don't, you, like, you know, that was Rory Robinson who pulled that one on me at Parliament House in 2007, I think, or maybe in 2008 when he pulled the, pulled the bet. And uh, I just casually said it. We never shook hands. We never wrote anything down. There was no agreement on how to define the bet, et cetera, et cetera. And I realised when the, when the house price bubble, I was going to get shafted. You know, forget about the logic. I'd get shafted on the result. Ignore the fact that they've doubled and trebled the amount of money giving to first home buyers. Uh, ignore everything else that was done, largely, partially, I can say, in response to the severity of my warnings. And the only two countries in the OECD avoided a recession, where Australia was one, I think South Korea was the other. And uh, I don't know anybody in South Korea that can take the credit, but I think in that sense, by you know, scaring the bejesus out of trout, I can take credit for it. Mm -hmm. did Canada and I get insulted. Hmm? Did, did Canada avoid a recession or did they go into one? Did they... Canada may have avoided as well. Yeah. I think it may have been three. I think it's Australia, Canada and South Korea. Yeah. But in the, in the case of Australia and Canada, what they've had as a result of that is continually rising private debt levels, household debt in particular, whereas in America, household debts reduced quite substantially after the crisis. Yes, yes. Well, really, they haven't really recovered in many areas after the 2008 mm. crisis. You know, you, I think there's mm. still areas where prices would be, even with the COVID kind of inflationary period, you've got prices that are below what they were at the peak in that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which we've gone well past it. So, you know, I, I, I identified what the disease was, <clears throat> too much private debt and, and credit growth, <clears throat> and Australia recovered by pushing the disease further on. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and it worked worked to treat until you got you know, increased levels of debt during COVID, uh, worse for the business sector than household, from what I can tell. Uh, but then they start putting up interest rates, and now you've got a high level of private debt, and interest rates are even more impactful on people's you know, spare money after paying their mortgage. So, it, it, you know, they're hiding to nothing that house prices would fall when they started putting interest rates up. Yeah. But inflation, yeah. different story. Uh, I mean, the economy really is land when you're talking about, I mean, the economy and, and uh, you know, not to simplify it, because obviously the economy is a very mm. complex mechanism, you know, which is, mm. which, uh, you know, what you study and, and we'll continue with that. But the, you know, because the banks then primarily against land, you know, when we're talking about private debt, we're talking about the land market. When we're talking yeah. about now, you know, people struggling to pay that debt, we're talking about the land market. And yet it, I feel like it is it is kind of largely ignored in policy because the tinkering that goes on in policy over here is really not to address the elephant in the room, which is we have to, it, it's not just about reducing land prices because this was, and I think this is where you came in with your um, political uh, paper. The debt, debt jubilee idea. Yes. Yeah. You can't just reduce it. You know, people say, oh, we just need to reduce land prices, but that is what actually happened through 2022. So what happened in, in 2018 as well, worse, worse than it was, well, I say worse than it was in 2022. It felt worse on the ground. It wasn't worse in terms of yeah. a, a medium drop. But, um, you know, prices going down was because it's not politically popular. People don't feel great that their prices are going down. Mm. Because so much of the economy is structured around the land market. There's so many businesses that are structured around the land market. It's a whole mm. industry and industries built on industries around it. And there's always, you know, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about now, obviously coming into, you know, the technology now, a sort of um, 
technocracy which has built up around the land market with not just with share platforms like airbnb but you know the way mm. that things are, are changing you know with um you know for example in the property management world you know the build to rent for you know people the, we've got these great mm. build to rent things which have got a 50 percent land tax discount in in many of our um states mm. so encouraging the build to rent but also that there's these um uh, property management technical systems that kind of now do all the property management you don't deal with a property manager you've got all technical systems that kind of sit behind mm. it so your methodology that I'm trying to get to here was you know we can't just reduce land prices we've got to have we've got to really support what's happening here can you talk through it because I don't see any other way it's a transition really that you put in yeah, place. I mean, I think yeah, you have it. You, you, you're quite. We've got a totally. We've we've let land speculation take over the economy. And like I know this, that I've been talking to people who are advisors in Paul Keating's cabinet back in uh, back in the Hawke Keating days. Uh, that they didn't quite know why, but both Labor and Liberal politicians knew that if there was a recession coming on, the best thing to do was to boost house prices. Okay. So you'd get things like the first home owners grant and stuff like that being brought in. Uh, because it would stimulate the economy, they weren't quite certain why. Well, the reason, uh, reason is simple. <clears throat> Credit is part of aggregate demand. Now, the economic theory uh, pretends that Catherine lends to Steve and Steve leans to Catherine through the through the mechanism of the of the nice introduction agency called uh, Ashley Madison. Oh no, sorry, man. I don't mean I don't mean sex. I mean money. I meant the Westpac or Commonwealth Bank. So they treat the um, treat the um, the banks as being like an introduction agency. They don't actually create money. And in that situation, if you lent me money or I lent, uh, you know, you would have less money powered over more. If I, I pay, pay, you've got more, I've got less. It's like a seesaw. The average remains the same. Uh, in the real world, banks lend, it isn't Catherine who lends to Steve, it's Westpac who lends to Steve. Catherine have to have a bank account in the same bank, but that's irrelevant to the loan to me. They say, yeah, buying that house in Q is a great idea. Here's $2 million. By the way, you owe us $2 million. So you get the money and you then pass it on to the vendor and the vendor gets two million, which they then spend into the land market and also the commodity market. Uh, so credit is a direct contributor. And I've mathematically proven this too. Credit is a direct contributor to um, aggregate demand and aggregate income. So if you inspire people to go and borrow money for a house, part of it leaks into, of course, into the housing market, but it also leaks into the real economy. And you therefore get a boom coming out of boosting house prices. And then, of course, a whole political class has grown up, including our own politicians, who are tied into being property owners and gained from rising house prices. So you've got a, a huge political miasma. It isn't just the that it's very important, the structure you spoke about, but it's the political miasma as well. People who's, in whose interest it is to see house prices rise are the ones who are in control of the economy. Mm. Talk about the jet, debt jubilee. What is the philosophy? <clears throat> Obviously, there's been debt jubilees. <clears throat> Back to the okay. Back. okay. The first thing is the government, in a in a in a strict sense, doesn't have debt. The government sells bonds. Okay. Uh, very different. If you try to sell a Catherine Cashmore bond to your next door neighbours, I'm sorry, you're not going to get very far. You try to sell a government bond, yes, they'll buy it. And what actually happens in the the mechanics of government finance is that when a government runs a deficit, it's it's spending more on the public than it's putting taxes on the public. So that gives the public more money. So a deficit creates money for the private sector. It also creates reserves for the banks. So the reserves rise, which earn, used to earn no interest. And then the government says, would you like to buy bonds from us? And the, the banks say, oh, we've got all these reserves, which are earning no interest. Yeah, we'll swap them for, for, for bonds, which earn interest. So that's where the demand for bonds comes from. It's a way of covering the deficit. It's not, it's not at all, um, it's a lot of technicality here, but that's the basic story. So the government can take on additional debt because it, it pays it with money it's, itself can create. So if the government said, we're going to give everybody X amount, I've just used $100,000 for a round number for all adults. And then if you're in debt, you must pay your debt down. If you're not in debt, you get a cash injection, which you could say could be used for different purposes, or you, know, you could limit it to, uh, you know, uh, buying a residential house or, uh, or or make make say you can spend on whatever you like. It's it's, it's that part is is in is uh, independent. But if you gave it to people with the debt, they've got to pay their debt down. So when their house prices fell as a result of that, so would their debt. And you could try to do the balance the two so that the the net effect on people's equity was constant while you brought the house prices down. Uh, but of course that goes completely against the political 
economy of Australia, that the politicians, the leading members of society, et cetera, et cetera, are mainly landlords and they don't want to see their prices fall and they've done very nicely out of this. And of course, the other um, myth that we kind of get, we hear all the time, and it was a big part of the election, it's a big part of what's going on now, and that is mm. that we get back to a surplus. And so, you know, it, how do we actually get back to a surplus? Where do we increase taxes? Where do we get the money from? You know, the, mm. the kind of constant narrative that goes on. Can, can you talk a little bit on that and explain to people? Yeah, okay. This, 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 is, this is people not understanding money, okay? And this is the classic thing that people think economists are experts on money. What they actually are are experts on dreaming up reasons not to have to analyse the monetary system. So if you go through a first-year economic course, they'll tell you, talk to you about the money illusion and on money neutrality. And they'll say that if you double all prices and double incomes, what happens to consumption? Nothing. Okay? So they say anybody who worries about the, about the nominal amount of money is an idiot because they don't understand the, uh, the, the, the uh, money, the, the falling for the money illusion. Uh, so they leave all this stuff out of their thinking completely. But when you, when you look at it, uh, money plays an essential role in the economy, obviously. I didn't have a, only an economist would need to convince money doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the, the money does matter. Money does matter. Okay? So when you look at it that way, there are how the question is how do you create money? And there are two ways that a domestic economy can create money. One is the banks lend out more than they get back in repayments. When they create money, and this has been acknowledged now by central banks, it still hasn't sunk into economic theory, but central banks acknowledge it, most of them, that if you if you rising levels of debt cause rising levels of money, but credit that's credit back money. The government creates money by spending more than it gets back in repayments. Okay. Uh, sorry, so spend, by spending more than it gets back in tax. Now, people then think, oh, well, the government's got to borrow to make up the gap. No, the government also is a money creator. It's a complicated mechanism involving the treasury, the central bank and the private banks. But the government fundamentally creates uh, uh, money by going into negative equity. Now, people think, oh, the government should be in negative equity. But then when you look at it, if your equity is your assets minus your liabilities. That's your equity. Okay, And, you're, and we're talking in financial assets, not houses. So this, this is financial claims. Okay, So financial claims, and that's things like mortgages, you know, uh, in anything which is expressed in monetary terms where you owe somebody money or they owe you money. The sum of all those assets minus liabilities is zero. So you know, if, if you let me money, I'd have a liability, you'd have an asset, we have them together, we get zero. Okay, that's, that's the base, and that explodes the whole economy. So if, 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 the, if somebody is in positive equity with respect to the rest of the economy, the whole rest of the economy is in negative equity there. So could we afford to be in negative equity, the government, the public? No, we can't, because we can't create money. Can the government afford to be in negative equity? To ask, can the government create financial claims on it for the rest of us to use? The answer is yes. Okay. So that's fiat money. And we have this horror about it because we have people controlling it, the economists who don't understand it. Okay. Well, you've got the government around the world believe they should run a surplus uh, because they're worried about the level of government debt. And they're being told this is a problem partly because they use a household analogy. You know, you shouldn't spend more than you get back in income. So you should have income that's higher than your uh, expenditure. But when you're working at the level of an entire national economy, expenditure is income. Okay? If you buy something off me, that's your expenditure, it's my income. That's a, a necessary. The one thing in macroeconomics that all economists agree with, despite their uh, intellectual framework, is that aggregate expenditure is aggregate income. Now, the mainstream have blinded themselves to the role of credit in aggregate demand by saying that, uh, you know, credit is uh, Catherine lends to Steve. And, uh, and and therefore, when Catherine lends to Steve, Steve can spend more, Catherine can spend less. Uh, they sort of cancel out. And when Steve repays Catherine, Steve can spend less, Catherine can spend more, it cancels out the other way. So they ignore the level of private debt and change in private debt on that logic. Now, when you look at the banking sector uh, using the sort of analysis that I do, it's not, a, and, the, and the central banks have finally acknowledged this starting in 2014 with the Bank of England. They said it's not, banks are not intermediary. They don't arrange a loan between Catherine and Steve. They give Steve a loan. And against that loan, uh, the, the loan turns up as money in Steve's bank account, which is a, a liability of the, of the uh, bank, but an asset, which is a loan for the bank at the same time. And then Steve, what I do is say, well, then Steve's going to spend that money. You don't borrow for the sheer pleasure of being in debt. 
So your change in debt becomes part of aggregate, your aggregate expenditure, your expenditure, and part of the income of the person on the other side. That's why credit plays a role. So I see that mainstream economists don't even want to go there. They don't see it. So that credit uh, is, is a major cause of the booms and busts, the ups and downs of the the 18 year cycle you talk about, a large part of it is driven by changes in the level of private debt and credit. And because we've allowed banks to get away with that, and because economists simultaneously don't think private debt or credit matter, we've had ballooning levels of private debt while the governments are trying to constrain its own spending and reduce its own debt. Mm. Now, that, the, 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 that's, that's, that's covering one way. One way you can create money is banks lend, back more than they, lend out more than they get back in repayments. The other side of it, which economists also don't understand, is the government creates money by spending more than it gets back in taxation. So that, that you know, if you think about it yourself, if, if you get taxed through your bank account, you get you spend through you, the government spends on you through your bank account. You, you don't necessarily the government spending on you, like you might be getting welfare payments, then you see the government spending directly on you. But your government expenditure to build roads outside turns up as income for people who then spend in your shop. So it's a the, 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 the aggregate effect of the government running a deficit is more money in private bank accounts. Yes. Now, when they try to put a surplus, that means they're trying to tax you more than they're spending on you. So the impact of a surplus is to take money out of private bank accounts. Now, that logic escapes conventional economists, I'm afraid to say. And that's where they, they, they focus on the surplus. In fact, if you want to have an economy with a mixture of credit-created money and fiat-created money, then you as well as wanting banks to be lending out more than you get back in repayments, but proportionally to GDP rather than rising far faster. You also want the government to be spending more than it gets back in taxes. Um, Otherwise, it's destroying money. Yes. Unfortunately, we are slaves to this system because that's really yeah. what it does to us. It enslaves the people within the economy. And I say that because the tax system disproportionately affects laborers because most taxes fall on labor income and so yeah. uh, the and which in itself is hurting the economy we don't have a tax system which is really concentrated i mean of you know you understand that i'm president of uh, prosper australia which is uh, yeah. an organization that was set up along the philosophy of henry george and so what we would like to see is uh, taxes removed off labor and productivity, labor income and productivity, and put more on monopoly rents, you know, which of which mm. land would be one of them. What we've got at the moment is is a really dire situation where people are getting, you know, the biggest bill you pay in your lifetime is your income tax bill. So, you know, people get kind of get hit hit with the taxes that they pay on their labor income, the deadweight costs that that causes within the mm. economy. And then actually what is interesting was I was listening to um, uh, the radio the other day of people calling in really upset that their land tax bills have escalated over, well, because they're now, when their land tax bill is coming in, it's coming in on last year's assessment. And of course it's coming yeah. in. <clears throat> and so their land tax bills have gone up. But that on top of the other taxes that people are paying, you know, it really is hammering the economy very it's hurting the economy and again you know you've got politicians that just don't understand that mechanism while they're trying to get into surplus through taxing people more you know we've got you can't have land tax going up and then in income taxes and productivity taxes hitting people as well something's got to give somewhere yeah and then taxation the idea that taxation finances government is is wrong okay government uh government finances itself by creating money and then I say, oh, yeah, something's come up when you, oh, <laughs> okay, you're video producer to both, we can ignore that. I'll, I'll go back to the question. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought again. Um, um, about the taxes. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah we, we tax, we, government taxation doesn't fund government spending. Governments fund itself by creating money. And then, of course, the amount of money it's creating now is huge. It's 30% of GDP every year and spending alone. It's got to take a large part of that out using taxation. Otherwise, you would get a huge you know, runaway money supply and you would have the runaway inflation. So the taxation role is to take money out of circulation. Uh, now, who's it, the thing is, who's it taking money out of in circulation? The answer is people who can't evade it, which is the working class and the middle class. The, the wealthy can locate themselves offshore. They can redefine uh, profits uh, very easily. Uh, you know, I don't think Rupert Murdoch's paid a cent in tax in the last you know, 30 years in Australia. I think he's made more than a cent in income. 
So you, you have uh, the wealthy can evade income tax, the poor can't. Uh, and then land tax, when that comes in, well, land tax is lagged, as you know. So people during falling house prices see their rising land rent, which is causing the screams you're talking about right now. Uh, but uh, they're, they're very blunt instruments in both cases to take money out of circulation. I'd be much more... Uh, if, if you look at in terms of taxation saying you want to reduce the impact of money, government money creation on the economy, then there are other mechanisms you could use. One, you could, you could have transaction taxes. So everybody, you know, financial transactions would, be, would hit so rip it couldn't avoid financial transactions. Uh, you, you could also basically sell people bonds and say, you know, part of the money we're giving you've got to be used on bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are various other mechanisms we could use. But while economists, and this is crazy, but it's true, while economists don't understand money, we're never going to get sensible policies on money or taxation. Yeah, and of course, Anthony Albanese is an economist. <laughs> it happens to... He, he, he actually did. He actually studied at the department I helped create called the Department of Political Economy in Sydney University. So he's slightly... He's not, he's not a complete uh, uh, slave to mainstream economic thinking. Uh, which in so many ways Paul Keating became because he swallowed a textbook after he became prime uh, became treasurer, uh, and certainly Morrison and Co were slaves to the economic textbook. So Anthony's not quite as much a slave, fortunately. No, but he's still obviously uh, oh, yeah. still in the system. I mean, he's not he's not putting anything out there about changing the mechanism. He's not. No, that's true. Waves within the system that he's in. Um, where where is where do you see things going? Like from here, obviously, you know, the rates are going up interest rates are going up that's affecting lending rates the banks actually are in quite a, a bit of a war for customers i mean they they want to attract more customers so there's there's a fair bit going on within banking where they're offering you know um benefits on new loans and then we've had some news that has come in over the last couple of weeks regarding um perhaps at removing the serviceability the buffer rates on the loans so lowering those so that people because it's because the housing affordability argument has morphed into one that prices are too high as into the you know you, you can't access a mortgage because interest rates are too high you know prices have actually come down quite a bit but it's still a problem we've still got a housing affordability problem i mean where where are things going to go from here from what you actually see in the the dynamics and everything are, are we heading into a recession what's your opinion oh um quite possibly but at the same time there's large amounts of government spending going on still as a result of covid um and uh you know the uh, the covid the covid bonuses have gone but that's what gave us a huge boom before the before this crisis hit if governments are trying to run a surplus they're going to push the economy down okay uh, so that that if they actually managed to get the surplus, then they would definitely have a government cause recession. Interest rate rises as well will have a similar impact. People will be spending less on housing, less credit creation. That'll cause a negative. So I'm expecting a downturn, but nothing as severe as 2008 globally, uh, because to have a real uh, d depression type effect rather than just a recession, you have to have credit going from highly positive to to, to negative. Now, it hasn't been highly positive. A, there was a blip during COVID because of, I think, uh, firm signing they had to take out lines of credit to continue operating when there's huge fall in their cash flows initially. But that was finally reversed by government policy. Um, but so the, you're not jumping. To, to break your leg, you've got to jump off a high cliff. We're jumping off a low cliff here. So I see a downturn coming out of it, um, but not, not, a, not a crushing one. And a lot of it is actually going to be caused by government policy, specifically the interest rates being put up by the central, by the reserve banks and other central banks around the world, which will take the wind out of the property market. So property going down, I think, is going to be a given uh, this time round until interest rates stabilise. And then, of course, the banks are going to be back at it again, trying to get us to borrow money to buy houses. Mm. So um, I, I see I see a, a slump, uh, but not a, not a depression style effect as we had back in 2008. Yeah. And interestingly enough, on the ground in the property market, there is a supply supply demand problem because we're almost getting to the point where we've got more demand than we have supply. Certainly you've got that in the rental market, but it's, it's a little bit of a hint of that pushing now into the property market because sales listings are so low, um, incredibly low. There's not enough stock on the market. And of course we've got immigration. Mm. Coming. So that, that could, that's actually made a little yeah. bit of a dial anyway. And there's yeah. kind of, early indicators that there might be a bit of a movement as to the market plateauing out and then potentially going up later this year 
Um, just depending, yeah. again, it obviously depends on where the lending rates go and and uh, yeah. But it, ultimately, you're cutting out your supply of new mortgages, new mortgages, new yeah. mortgages, because the higher with the level of the, the deposit you have to get together to actually get onto the market has been rising over time. The age of the first home buyers been rising. I think they first home buyers are turning up in their forties now, aren't they? Yes. Uh, they used to be in their twenties. Uh, so you're just reducing the proportion of the population that can jump on that ladder. So it ultimately reaches a saturation point. And I think we've been bouncing around that saturation point for a long time after the financial crisis. So it makes it, it it's not the market it was back in the, in, the, in the 90s where prices were relatively low and there was plenty of room to push up household debt, which is what the banks did. And now they've reached saturation levels. So it's rather more complicated for them. Yes, it's a little bit more complicated. We need, need a few more home buy grants and a few more government institutions. <laughs> to, to I, put... I, I wouldn't be at all. I, I, oh, my, I'd be shocked, shocked <laughs> if there was a first home buyers grant going on here. <laughs> That's why it would be totally unexpected to see something like that. Totally happen. unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, what are you doing? <laughs> Historical precedent. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't want to wind up this interview until I've given you a chance to um just briefly discuss the what you're doing on climate. And this was yeah. a bit interesting for me because obviously I don't, this is not my field of expertise. I don't know an awful lot about, about it other than what mm. I hear. And uh, when you sent me your paper, um, so you said that you were doing a lot of work on this and you look into the economic mm. this paper and I just did, didn't a huge amount of analysis on it, but had a look through it. It was really fascinating, really interesting, because there's two things here which kind of stick out to me. One is that I actually don't think I really knew what climate change is. I just exactly the definition. I had the no warmer. idea of the definition of climate. Change. I just thought the weather's getting a bit warmer, or average, the average mm. is getting warmer, and that's that's what they're they're saying. That's what global warming is. And then the other thing is is just it's like you've uncovered a whole new. Uh, like a neoclassical economic analysis of what climate change is going to do to the economy and the models of which it's based on. Well, we're talking about the models of, of that have got us into financial mm. crisis with housing. I mean, this is even mm. worse. I mean, they're just appalling. And so we've got governments that are preaching climate change to us and say we need to do something about it. When actually they they've got these models uh, of what the climate what that change might do to the economy, which are complete nonsense. So can, do you want to just uh, launch off on that? and just explain yeah sure I, 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 I got into climate change indirectly because I, I had to do it my own intellectual contribution which is the, the the line about energy labor without energy is a corpse capital that energy is a sculpture led to a mathematical way of modeling the role of energy in production and then I thought okay I can engage in this discussion and then I expected to find I'd be criticizing the economists for the type of models they use like I mentioned the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that economists use in the RBA uh, and they're based on what's called a Ramsey growth model. So I thought I'd have to go and explain why that's the wrong model to use. I opened my first paper and I find that economists assume they could get data on climate change by looking at the correlation between temperature in, in, in regional, you know, in, say, let's say gross state product in America, by looking at the relation between gross state product in America and average temperature in American uh, states, they could derive what's going to happen out of climate change. And I thought, you fools. You complete absolute fools. You do not understand what climate change is. Um, so that's that's my starting perspective. And I then I haven't even talked about their model because their assumptions about the data, which is so wrong. Um, so what they're telling us, and this is this this is the sort of stuff the central banks are working on. Uh, they are assuming that a four degree increase in temperature would reduce global uh, income by between seven and twenty three by between ten and twenty three percent compared to what it would be in the complete absence of global warming. Now, this is that, that's the IPCC economic section report 2022. So I'm quoting the IPCC economists. And of course, when politicians tell their staff to read the IPC report, they read the economic section. They don't read what the climate scientists are talking about. They come back to the politicians and say, oh, in 2100, they reckon GDP is going to be 23% uh, lower than it would be without Climate change. Politicians says, oh, wait, 23% fall in GDP. I said, oh, no, 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 no. The GDP in 2100 will be 23% lower than it would be in the absence of climate change when we expect it to grow by 2% per annum per capita. So rather than being five times richer, let's say four times richer than we are the day per head, 
we're only going to be three times richer. And that's going to happen in 2100. The politician says, well, why are you telling me about it then? What can I say at the cameras to make me look like concerned about it and do nothing at the same time? Now, that's the world we live in. When you look at what climate, then that's so the science the economists have simply said by extrapolating that the, the difference between Florida's GDP and New York's GDP and North Dakota's GDP, you can fit it using a parabola and New York's the top. So that's the ideal temperature. And they're going to move along this nice, very, very comfortable curve. That's literally what the economists have assumed climate change is going to do right out to 2100. And so that this is the nonsense they've done. So I want to give people an example of what climate change could mean. Um, Australians enjoy the sunshine, don't they? Love going out to the beach. Okay. Well, in Melbourne, we enjoy it when we get it. Yes. Um, <laughs> you can do that because we think of the ozone layer around the planet that stops damaging ultraviolet radiation, frying you when you walk outside. Now, the ozone layer will be under threat from climate change. Now, this is working from the the guy, I'm, I'm quoting now a guy called uh, James Anderson, who is a professor of atmospheric chemistry at Harvard University. So I'm not talking about, you know, a crank somewhere. He's the expert on ozone. He's the person who discovered the hole in the ozone layer back around, over in Antarctica, which we had the, the CFC campaign to get rid of. His argument is that when the, when the Arctic summer sea ice disappears, and that's when we have no longer have ice in the Arctic in summer, the Arctic will go from reflecting 90% of the energy that falls on it to absorbing 90%. That will then mean an increase in the volatility of the atmosphere in the Northern Hemisphere, which will mean that storms on the American uh, Midwest Plains that currently stay in the X section of the atmosphere, known as the troposphere, which is the area we live in, will go to the stratosphere. Now, the troposphere, of course, has got moisture. Okay? The stratosphere is virtually dry. So you'll get moisture passing into the stratosphere. That doesn't sound so bad. However, the moisture will contain substantial traces of chlorine and bromine which are both ozone-depleting uh, chemicals. And in combination with the moisture, that will catalyze the destruction of ozone and increase it by a factor of 100. Now, if he's correct, that means no ozone layer. When no ozone layer, that means no possibility of human activity during daylight. That's climate change. There were other examples I could give. That's the scariest that I've seen in the literature from a highly reputable source. So you don't want to try and out whether he's right. Yes. Okay. You hope he's wrong. You don't want to find out that he's right. What we are doing by increasing the global temperatures is making that a possibility. And so we'll soon know, we'll find out in 10 or 20 years whether James Anderson is right or not. And if he's right, there's no human civilization. If he's wrong, we continue on. But this is the precautionary principle. You don't want to find out the hard way. But because economists have trivialized the whole thing and said it's a you know maximum 25% fall in GDP in 80 years' time, uh, <coughs> and assuming growth all the way through. Uh, we're doing nothing about it. And we are going to run into a crisis because it is a change in the structure, <coughs> pardon me, the structure of the planet's circulation system. Not just we get a bit warmer, the whole structure changes. So you see those crazy storms like you saw in New Zealand, Auckland getting, you know, one quarter of its annual rainfall in a day, the cyclone hitting the northern, uh, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the cyclone hitting the northern reaches of the, south, the, northern, the uh, North Island. Mad stuff like the storms you've got in Sydney and Melbourne at the moment. Uh, the, the, all this stuff, this is change in the structure of the weather. And we established human civilization during a remarkably stable period for the average temperature called the Holocene. Uh, uh, if we disturb that, then the stability that is, again, it come back to land, the stability that enables to build sedentary civilizations will be gone. And so you'll have wheat fields one day and you won't have wheat fields the next. And therefore, we're going to be forced to go back to being hunters and gatherers. That's what climate change could do to us. And economists have completely trivialized the dangers. And this is far, far worse than the financial crisis. So I really think what they've done by trivializing the dangers, and this is all uh, because they simply believe economies so flexible that can cope with anything. So climate change can't be a threat. That's the sort of thinking that economists have fallen into. Uh, they could destroy capitalism. Mm. Uh, the, um, I watched you do, I watched an interview with you on this subject, and you were talking about different the structure basically and the whole mm. structure of the system changing and yeah. uh, it's, it's done it historically for natural reasons it, it, it's not unprecedented is kind of what i'm saying so i mean it has happened in the past yeah thinking oh well you know climate change not necessarily i don't believe in it or i don't but more so because obviously we know that it happens but more so you know i don't know what the cause of it is the point is that this has happened before and this is what 
they're saying that we could go on for it to happen again. And these, because you spoke about, I don't remember how you spoke about it, but certain like certain areas of the globe being in certain yeah. And there, so they there are, there are th yeah, there, there, there are three circulation patterns in the atmosphere. There's a there's rising air at the equator that falls at 30 degrees north and south. And then there's uh, there's rising air at 30 that falls at 60. And there's rising air at 60 that falls at 90. So imagine like you've got a pot of, of soup on the stove and there are three bubbles you know, turning up. Okay. Yeah. Um, as you increase the temperature, it breaks down and one big bubble takes up. So that, that change, it, it takes an enormous amount of energy to do that, but we're providing the energy by blocking the retransmission of solar radiation using carbon dioxide. So if we increase the energy levels enough, that first cell, which is the one that goes from th zero to 30, it's called, that's called the, the Hadley cell, that can expand so it goes right to the pole. Mm -hmm. Now, if that happens, what you have is rising air at the poles, falling air, so rising air at the equator, falling air at the poles, in the middle, not no, it, it, it's just a heat, one big conveyor belt going like that. So you'll get rainfall in the north, you'll get rainfall in the south, but in the middle you could get normally, but not all the time, drought. Mm -hmm. Now, this is that's what's called an equable climate. And we I think the last of that was about last time that was seen was about 200,000 years ago and there's various periods in the in the past I'm not sure about that particular detail but there have been periods where that happens so that's why we found we have found um skeletons of alligators in the polar polar region because once that you've got rising air at the equator when it falls at the poles it's still warm so the average temperature of the of the, of the arctic can go from minus 10 or 20 to plus 22 the average the temperature during those equable periods the average temperature of the pole was about 20 degrees, even keeping in the fact that half the year it was in darkness. So with that that effect has mean everything we've built our civilizations on is completely transformed. Now, a lot of there are various arguments by scientists when that will happen. Mathematical models predict it'll happen on the current tradition, not until the mid 20, 22nd century. Anderson claims it'll happen at 500 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide and uh, and the loss of the Arctic summer sea ice. Now, again, most scientists say he's going to wrong. I don't want to find out that he's right the hard way. Okay? Yeah. So when somebody is, is, is reputable and an expert on that front says something like that, I'd say we've got to do everything we can to stop that uh, temperature rise causing that structural change in the atmosphere. But this is the sort of work we're playing with. Now, economists have no idea of that because those idiots, and frankly, that's what they deserve to be called, those idiots believe that 10 degrees of warming is survivable. Certainly. Nordhaus has published a paper in an American Economic Review journal saying six degrees of warming will cause an 8.9% fall in GDP compared to what it would be in the absence of climate change. The central banks are talking four degrees and 20, 23%. Uh, they have no idea. They do not understand it at all. Um, but they've built this little cabal of people who just think it's all about just rising average temperature and changing, mainly fitting agriculture. Uh, the craziest assumption, you probably remember this one, is that Nordhaus assumed that 87% of American economy would be unaffected by climate change because it takes place in what he called carefully controlled environments. And in that he included all of manufacturing, all of wholesale and retail services, all of government activity, all of the finance sector, all of the real estate except that on the coast, uh, and, it, and, and, um, and mining. This is the funny thing, mining. Now, what he just he, 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 later on he said, "Oh, underground mining." What he's saying, a roof will protect you from climate change. This is how simplistic they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 really not surprising though, is it? From what you know, I mean, you'll be looking at this and thinking, "Oh, I you. but the, I guess the consequences, you know, from what you're explaining, are a lot worse. You know, when we're looking at oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I saw economists, yeah, I saw economists damaging the economy by not understanding money and credit and land and energy. Now I see them damaging the potential for human civilization. Yeah. And that is just far more drastic. So I'm actually, I'm arguing with scientists, friends. We have to run a campaign to get economists thrown out of the university sector. Now, I'm sorry, but a lot of good meaning economists out there think they're doing good work and not working in this area and so on. Economics published these papers. Only economists would have allowed this garbage. And I'm being quite... <laughs> blunt of the course in what I think about these papers only economists would allow somebody to publish a paper on climate change where they seem to roof can protect you from climate change yeah so it's, I, on, it's on the discipline that this stuff got through get out of universities you're you're a pseudoscience 
Well, I guess you need to look at who the universities are almost sponsored by as to, you know, how did that how did that happen in the first place that you've got that mm. economics became so corrupted? Speaking of which, mm. uh, I know that Fred Harrison and Mason Gaffney wrote a book called The Corruption of Economics. You might have heard of it. I don't know whether you have, but they I haven't they, seen that one, no. Oh, it's 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 very good book, but I mean their reasoning, it was basically how economics became corrupted and changed in the university system um, in order to knock land out of the equation so that you've got three factors of production that then became two factors of production. So yeah, yeah. And and like really the, 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 Mark, the same thing applied back in the 1870s when Marx turned classical economics as a weapon against capitalism. The what was called uh, a, a fringe theory, which was based on people like Jean-Baptiste Say and Augustine Corneau. Uh, which we now call neoclassical economics, that took over. And that was a large part because, you know, where, whereas the classical school used, was used as, by Smith and Ricardo to support capitalism against feudalism, he was marked using it to attack capitalism. Uh, so the, the, this fringe group took over. And that's a similar sort of thing to what you're talking about. Again, the same sort of time as Henry George as well. So yeah. this theory comes out and talks about a perfectly equilibrating model and, uh, and it's very seductive. Uh, and that's why economists fall for it. Uh, but in tech, when you look at the empirical data, everything in the empirical data contradicts their assumptions, including, obviously, leaving land out of the equation. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got a lot of work to do, Steve, uh, <laughs> getting out there, promoting your work and I know. opinions. Um, it's funny, I actually interviewed Fred Harrison um, a few weeks ago and... Uh, him and, and, and a guy called David Murray. And I don't know whether you've heard of David, but um, a global forecaster. Mm. But um, they were they're they're both forecasting war. Really, they're, that's what their their sort of premises is that we're really heading towards World War Three. And Fred Harrison's been mm. saying that for a while in regard to what was going to happen at the end of this cycle. So saying at the end of this cycle, we've got this cataclysm of of things going on because there's not enough food in certain parts of the mm. world got a migrant crisis from North Africa and you know going into areas of Europe because there's mm. not food and then um you know he's got the obviously the debt crisis is coming into that but he's also saying that you know they the governments are supposed to be doing something about the climate by 2030 they're not going to mm. do anything about it because all of these things are going to attack the economy at once they're going to r- run into this debt crisis this migrant crisis you know that that we we've got you know war who would have thought we would be watching you know russia i know no, ukraine yeah yeah mm. so we've got that going on and so we're kind of heading for this cataclysm that's going to probably occur at the end of this cycle and they're not prepared for it and and he sort of feels that that's really going to he feels this, it, he, he's really very he didn't want to use a kind of biblical term when he was talking about it you know that we're sort of heading into this armageddon type of scenario but he said he doesn't know what else you know what other word to use in a way because he really sees it as that occurring you know that sort of happening which is obviously what we're we're all sort of talking about but yeah i mean so it's interesting interesting thoughts i don't, I don't know whether you kind of have as much gloom over <laughs> what you think well, is- I'm trying, but what i what i do see and i'm seeing summer coming through my window so i'm turning into the dark with the sun coming in from outside and summer is rising in in europe um yeah i, I we are going to see food crop failures there's the one likely outcome of clever like for example another thing on climate change economists have argued that losing what's called the AMOC, which stands for the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, which is what keeps one of the two factors that keep Europe warm, the other is the Gulf Stream. People tend to confuse the two. But losing the AMOC, which is this huge uh, oceanic uh, circulation pattern, will improve GDP by 1.1%. It'll make the temperature fairer. Uh, scientists doing the same, uh, it's modelling the same phenomenon, said that there'd be a fall in the amount of land that can support wheat from 20% to 7% of the Earth's surface and a similar fall, 15% to 5% for, for, for corn. So if that phenomenon does happen, we're going to have a global famine. Now, a global famine will lead to massive migration caused by, caused by famine and then conflict, border conflict and so on, and potentially war. So we have an awful future uh, coming our way. And that's because fundamentally because economists led us to underestimate the dangers of climate change. Now we're going to find out the hard way. And yes, that will lead to human conflict on a grand scale. Yeah, I mean, we we talk about, you know, people will say, put out terms of, you know, religion is 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 has killed more people, religion, the cause for war and everything. But really what, what we're saying here is economists, <laughs> the, the school yep. of economics. It's really causing and more- they, they, they and they will they will have no idea they're guilty and they'll think they're completely innocent. That includes the people making these stupid predictions. 
So Nordhaus will come out when it starts hitting the fan, really hitting the fan. He'll say, oh, you should have heeded my warning to put up the social cost of carbon. But his work trivialised the dangers. So economists will be totally not comprehending that they're under attack and totally guilty at the same time. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I hope people take notice of this interview. Uh, I think it's covered some really important points. And yeah, I hope it inspires people really to look into the work that you're doing a little bit deeper as well, because mm. I think that it's overlooked. You know, pe people don't realize I certainly had no idea when it came to sort of the economics of climate change. I had no idea that mm. events really until you kind of flagged it in front of me. So it's really fascinating. And we all, unless we're all involved in economics and understanding economics, we can't actually change it. It's everything's going to continue as it, as it is right now. So it, it's really important messaging that's going out there. But thank you so much for joining me. Again, very much appreciative. I know that you're really busy and that you're getting a lot of calls for interviews and everything. So I appreciate you giving Australia a bit of your... Mm. Love, love that I talk to you again, Catherine, too. There's some good people in Australia, you're one of them. So it's, yeah, uh, thank you yeah. so much. I haven't completely forgotten my homeland. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Um, and of course, if uh, you come back, you must let us know because we will we'll certainly set up a, a speaking event for you across for Australia as well. So we'd love to do that. Yeah, I can't see any reason at the moment to come back, but that might happen. I have to wait and see. So, uh, it's a long way. And I'll, so, and I'll yeah. keep you in touch with the with the credit data too when I get that next load from the Bank of International Settlement. That could be some interesting stories. Yeah, please relate. do. We can jump on and, and do another interview on that. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, mate. Okay. I'll talk to you.